Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic this time is Client Relations, Avoiding Grievances. And speaking today will be Claude Duclou from LawPay. Claude Duclou is an attorney licensed in Texas, Colorado, and California who speaks regularly on legal ethics, law office management, and trial-related topics. In 2011, he won the highest statewide award from the State Bar of Texas for a lifetime contribution to CLE and has been invited to speak at more than 150 programs since January 1, 2009. Mr. DeClue has a long legacy of bar service, including being president of the Austin Bar Association and serving as chair of almost every major bar-related entity, as well as the Texas Bar Foundation. The Industry Insight webinar series is hosted by the ABA Legal Technology Resource Center. To stay updated on upcoming webinars or view previous vi videos, visit ambar.org slash industry insight. You can also stay updated on legal technology news through our blog, lawtechnologytoday.org. Thank you all for joining us today, and we'll now begin the webinar. Hi, everybody. This is Claude Duclou. I'm talking to you from Austin, Texas. Now, this presentation that I give, I have about 30 minutes. It's usually an, an hour, so I've had to cut a lot of the out of it. But we have a lot of information to cover, and I hope you'll find it very enjoyable. Anything that I tell you during this, uh, if you want to follow up with me, there'll be my email at the end. If, if there's any forms that I talk about that you would like to see, uh, I'm happy to send those to you. I'm happy to follow up ha however you would like uh, me to assist you. Now, let's go right into it. What are the top five grievances in the whole country? They're, number one is communication. You don't keep in touch with the client. You don't respond to that client. That's the number one nationwide grievance. And a lot of the reason is that you don't like that client anymore. You, you maybe bit off more than you can chew. So what you do is you just ignore that client. Number one grievance. Neglect. Well, that usually results in failure to communicate when you haven't worked on the case and you've promised another attorney or another uh, or, or your client this thing will be done by its X date and you haven't done it. Then mishandling the attorney-client relationship. You haven't had an uh, attorney fee agreement. You haven't made the necessary disclosures or checked for conflicts. And then you have this row with your client about whose file is it? Do they get their client uh, the file back? Yes. The short answer is yes, they do. And then attorney fee disputes. If you are in private practice and you get through it without ever having an attorney fee dispute, I suggest you're only working for your family. Uh, because every lawyer is going to have some inevitable attorney fee conflicts, uh, whether or not it's that lawyer's fault or, or anything. And then I'm surprised, it's number five, that I still have to tell lawyers how to use uh, IOLTA or you know attorney trust accounts and how they, they use them improperly. All right, let's start at the very beginning. How do you uh, have a great relationship with your client? You learn to communicate. You interview them property, properly. And the goal of any interview that you have with a client is this, reasonable expectations. You know, that means you listen very carefully, and I can't stress enough that we need to learn from our uh, psychological colleagues that they tell us, sit and listen. Close off any other, don't take phone calls, don't handle emails. Make that client the absolute focus of your attention, because if you have to push back on something they expect or think or an unreasonable expectation, they need to know that you've listened to their whole story. You may know in the first 10 minutes what the client needs, but that doesn't let them use you as a sounding board, which you need to do. Uh, so make sure that you, you vet that client properly. And what the attorney can do, at the end of each interview, I say there's two great questions that you simply have to uh, ask, and that is, what do you think I can do for you? And then you find out if they have reasonable expectations or if they brought you a $20,000 case and they think they're going to get a million dollars. Because you ask that question, what, okay, what are your expectations? What do you think we can do for you in this office? Uh, and if the answer simply is, well, you're the attorney, tell me that's a great answer. Uh, the other question is, now that I, I we've form this bond and I understand your case, tell me, help me if it's a contested sort of matter, whether that's a divorce or a lawsuit, what is the other party saying about you to his or her lawyer? It's amazing how they will open up then and tell you some of the bad things that may have occurred in their background. Well, I've been through bankruptcies, I've been through you know, three divorces, I've been this. Now that's nothing that the client has told you, but now that you've given them that opportunity to prophylactically protect you from all this bad information, they will open up to you. So you, at the end of that interview, the reasonable expectations could be, here's what I think I can do, and give people 
options. Say, look, it's a consumer case. I might be able to get 85% of your money back with a couple of letters. Will that be enough? Because that last 15% might be in a lawsuit, you know, nine months down the line, discovery, much more expense. So give the people the options all the time to, uh, uh, you know, tell you what their reasonable goals should be. And then always make sure they understand what your fee is going to be, whether that's going to be an hourly rate, a combination hourly and contingency fee rate. So these are what you then do, your housekeeping items, before you take the case. And early on in that interview, good lawyers learn early on in the first five minutes to ask who else could be involved in this. Now, I've been practicing almost 40 years, so obviously I have conflicts of interest. But young lawyers who may be listening thinking, look, I just want to get anybody in the door. I'm not going to have a conflict because I've only had 12 clients in my whole life. But I have lots of conflicts after 40 years in a town even as big as Austin, which is you know a million people now. So I have learned to ask, wait, who is this involved? And frequently I'll say, oh, no, I, this involves a company that I represent and their real estate venture. So because it depends on what the client thinks, whether or not an attorney-client relationship has been formed regardless of whether or not you've signed up that client. If you allow that client to go on for 45 minutes and they tell you all their secrets, all their confidences, all their expectations, and then you find out at the very end, by the way, a person I need to sue, I need to sue is a client of the firm already, guess what? You're conflicted out. That client had a reasonable expectation that what he was telling you was confidential, and you have not stopped early enough to say, whoa, 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 well, who is involved in this? Always find out if they're previous lawyers. Again, the client's goals, are they realistic? You either have to have realistic goals based upon your perceptions as an attorney. Like, no, I can't get this client a million dollars on a $20,000 case. The great answer to that is and when a client says, well, my brother had a case like this in St. Louis and got a million dollars, then you should say, well, you need to hire your uh, brother's attorney because I can't do that for you. Now remember, it's very, very important about what the client's motivations are. There are people that say, I just want to sue for the principal. I am warning you right now, folks, if you are just suing for the principal, you can never make that client happy. That client has, by definition, he or she has unreasonable expectations. And even if you get them 98% of what they want, you have failed that client. So be very careful about taking cases where they uh, are suing for the principal. I say raise your rate because you're going to earn it. All right. What are the client's goals? Are they realistic? And for what they can expect in accomplishing their goals, give them timelines, costs, alternatives. These are what you dish out to the client before you finish that interview and you sign up that client. Make sure the goals are realistic. Now. What is the secret? I say this to, I'm, I'm very honored that every year I give the speech to all the incoming lawyers in Texas. And I said the one word that is absolutely exemplifies the practice of law is communication. Always keep in touch with your client. Always keep in touch with the court or opposing counsel as soon as possible. We used to say when I was on the grievance committee and I was counsel of the grievance committee for three years that this was the days before email or um, the faxes that if there were three letters to the client from the lawyer in the client's file, there was never any grievance because that lawyer was reasonably keeping that client informed. I have, for, you know, for the last 20 years, because I've had so much experience handling grievances for other lawyers, I'll come in on a Sunday or stay one Monday night and I'll just send, you know, 20 one sentence, two sentence emails to my clients just to let them know I'm thinking about you. Dear Mary, I know the interrogatories were due on August 31st. They needed extra time. We gave them until September 30th. As soon as they come in, I will send them to you. If you have any questions, let me know. Just want to let you know what's going on. I, I send a dozen of those to just clients to say, haven't forgotten you. Um, you know, here's what's going on. And they just love that. Client just love the fact that you reach out to give them little updates. Also, I say, uh, the lawyers always ask me, what's the best way to get work in the door? What's the best way to get work in the door? And I say, is to have good relationship with your colleagues in your legal community. And that means getting work out the door is the best way to get work in the door. If you're in, for example, I'm going to just pick a case, a divorce case, and you've promised the other a lawyer that you're going to have the decree there, the rough draft by Wednesday, have it there on Wednesday. You know, we all know lawyers in our community that are just completely slovenly and they will never get their work out the door and you and they're nice people, but you know that if you have that attorney on the other side of a case, you're going to be doing all the documents. Just ask yourself, would you ever send any work to that lawyer? Of course you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to, you know, 
make a client angry with you for giving them that lawyer. What do you want to send the client to? to a lawyer you've worked in that you respect, who does you, who maintains good communication, who does his or her share of the work on time, that's who gets the referral. All of my work, I think I've never advertised, comes from happy lawyers and happy clients referring their friends and their, and their uh, colleagues to me because they've enjoyed having a relationship, a legal relationship with me. The other thing is when you're communicating, don't withhold back new, bad news or try to sugarcoat anything. Don't blame the judge, you know, like, well, we had our motion for summary judgment, you know, we had a stupid judge. Those types of emails, I promise you, will haunt you. You always prepare the, the client, well, as you knew, I told you there was about a 50-50 chance the judge just didn't see it that way and overruled us, and um, that, that was a, a distinct possibility in this kind of case. If you trash the judge, it gets back to the judge inevitably, inevitably it does, and then you will ruin your relationship with the court. Um, and also, I always say keep after someone, whether it's your own client who's not communicating you, with you or anybody. If they're, if they're your own best protection is to keep after that person, to uh, just to send very polite, diplomatic, "Hey Bob, did I miss calendar the your interrogatory answers? I show they were due today. Um, uh, do you need a little more time? Or give me a call. Let me know when I can expect them." And rather than, well, once again, you've blown through the discovery deadline. That's not how you make friends. You always give people the benefit of the doubt to start out with and send really nice communications. All right, let's go on. Um, the multi-party matter. If the client suggests a multiple client representation, you have to identify the parties of law. And if there is a conflict, you determine whether that conflict is waivable. And we'll talk about that. Uh, waivable conflicts, uh, you have to identify what they are and say the benefit of your handling it for both of them and the detriment of the fact of the conflict. In your rules, every state has those rules, there's conflicts of interest on how they waive. This is part of my longer presentation where I give you all of those uh, little little tidbits. But uh, anyway, I'll make sure you look at your disciplinary rules or, or your rules of conduct. Now also, if they say, um, let me go back here a second on this last bullet point, if they say, M me and Bob and Mary are forming a corporation, you have to have the discussion, all right, whom do I represent? Do I represent Bob, my longtime client, or will I be the attorney for the corporation? The difference is, of course, that if I'm the attorney for the corporation, I must have equal access for communication to all three of you shareholders. I can't withhold anything from you or anything like that. Um, so make sure they, they, you know when you're having a multi-party representation which party, which entity, what your role is going to be, and make the parties acknowledge that in writing. All right, documents. Always have a written fee contract, especially for new clients. Now, the other thing is, you know how I told you out there that if you needed any uh, information, send me an email. I have a short form contract. I have a long form contract. I have lots of good stuff in there that you can cut and paste into your own contracts. The other thing, you see the privacy policy at the end of that first uh, sentence? Most states, the state of Texas already has a mandatory, if you handle confidential information, and every lawyer handles confidential information, even if it's a, simply a, a Social Security number, you must have a privacy policy. I have an Exhibit A to my attorney fee agreements that identifies the privacy policy. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be 10 pages long, it can be four sentences long, simply saying that everyone in my office is trained not to release information. If it's going to be released, they have to go through me, they have to get permit, blah, blah, blah. So those little privacy policies are really good to stick in and plug into your attorney fee agreements. The other thing that I do now, we have such digital uh, we have done such a digital age that I have a file destruction clause because many of us are going to paperless office. I haven't quite made that whole transition myself, but I'm trying to. And so I'm saying I have a, the authority, unless I'm required by law, uh, to keep records longer. For example, you have to keep trust records in Texas for five years, your trust account records. But four years after this matter is completed, unless I'm required, you're giving me um, uh, permission to safely destroy it, and I have some copying clauses about that. You know, I'll make them extra copies if they want. Um, now, also with old clients, if you have a, an agreement with an old client, and you've and I've had many old clients. I've had clients I've represented more than 30 years. They know me, how much I charge, but I'll at least send them a quick little reminder email, sort of as attorney fee client. As you know, you've told me to handle the uh, Mercedes matter, and I'll just use my standard billing rate of X. 
you know, and send you normal updates and, and bills. So just have something that you can put in the file. Now, if somebody is coming to, you know, if unless you're doing it for charity, and many of you may be working for trusts or maybe working for a agency, you're doing this for money. So make sure when you're interviewing a client, how does that client plan to pay you? And look at that client. If he's coming in, and I mean, it doesn't mean he's just not a you know, somebody who dresses down, which is fine too, they could be a billionaire and, and have t-shirt and flip-flops, but if they come in a t-shirt and flip-flops and you know this is going to be a $20,000 case, make sure you have a good feeling about that you're actually going to get paid by this person, especially if you're, like, you're the third attorney and the first two haven't been paid. That's pretty good uh, warning that a little alarm bell should be going on inside that I will never get paid. And if the client always says, don't worry, my brother's going to send you the retainer next week, you stop and say, I can wait till it gets here. Don't get started on anything without having a payment plan. The other thing that modern lawyers have done, which I started doing, even though I'm a, a lawyer with a six in, in front of my age, um, about 10 years ago I started using law pay, and as a solo practitioner, it has supercharged my practice. Now about, I send out maybe 40 bills a month, and about 20 of them my clients now, and it's increasing, want to get it by email. So I send an automatic link that they can just pay me with a credit card, and I'm telling you, uh, a, a We'll talk about this in a little bit, but within an hour of my sending out my electronic bills to my clients, I have thousands of dollars in credit card payments, and it's just the easy way to get paid, and it's a way that you can coach your clients into coax your clients into doing that. Now, the other thing you let's talk about communication. A big mistake. Remember, the number one complaint was communication. Well, one of those times you have to be particularly careful with clients is when they change the narrative, when they, um, you know, say, "Well, you told me this case was going to be fifteen hundred dollars," and you go, "No, you told me that, that this is going to be." You always respond, well, "No, that was unfortunately this is exactly uh, what we talked about. You said it was all agreed to. It's not agreed to, and of course now it's taking a lot longer." Always respond to a miscommunication about what the facts have been, whether it's from your own client, from opposing counsel. It looks really bad, I will tell you, in a malpractice case or a grievance case, when that client has sent you four emails stating one set of facts and you haven't responded to any of them, which it makes it look like he or she is saying the truth when they're not. But you have made them control, you have given them control by not responding. All right, anytime you have a fee agreement, um, or a bill, envision a court or a fee dispute committee or a grievance committee putting it up on a PowerPoint. Would you, are your contracts clear? Are your bills comprehensible? Are they reasonable? Don't use dumb billing entries, right? Don't use things like uh, looked at uh, file, point three. No, always make it, especially with private clients that aren't institutional clients, talk with Bob about upcoming uh, pre-trial, blah, 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 rather than, you know, updated client file, point three. Also, I always say dumb billing entries are making your stapler a profit center. I do not charge my clients for office supplies. When they come in, they expect me to be a lawyer. They don't expect me to have to run out to Office Depot and buy paper because they've hired me. So when I see, you know, you know, uh, costs for like, you know, stapling and all that kind of stuff, it just drives me crazy and I just shake my head saying this looks so stupid to a fee dispute committee. All right, big picture. Let's talk about the fee dispute. The big picture is this. Truly, listen to me here, folks. No practicing lawyer will escape fee disputes. No practicing lawyer will escape a fee dispute. If you have a vibrant practice, there's just going to be people. Remember also, and I, I meant to say this earlier, you see people a lot of times at their worst. They're stressed out. Something has gone horribly wrong. They're losing their spouse, their business, their children, or something like that. So they're not happy being there anyway. So they're going to remember things the way they do it, and they, sometimes they flat run out of money. Now, a lot of times you share the blame about that. You ignore the warning signs. That guy in the flip-flops and t-shirt where you said, well, sure, he can come up with $30,000. You spent too much. Especially, I see young lawyers will get a $5,000 retainer and they burn through $2,500 of it in 
the first 10 days. No, no, no. That's your, that's your water to get through the desert. Make sure that you make that retainer last. Don't have anybody's eyebrows raised when they look at your bill. My goal is when they look at my bill, they're going to say, that sounds like about, about what I expect Claude to spend on this case. Or you improperly budgeted the matter. You said, I can get through this for $1,500. And of course you can. It wasn't the client's fault. You made a mistake. It's like a, a car guy saying, I'll, I'll replace your engine for $1,500. And they saying, oh, God, that was terrible. I, I didn't realize I was going to have all these other problems. Follow. It's your fault. Okay. Or you outspent your production. Now, and here's the big truth about clients. Good clients will do their best to work out something with you. I mean, good clients occasionally run out of money, and you like them, and they like you, and they say, look, Claude, I'm really sorry. Can I just pay you $100 a month or $200? And I'll say, sure. But if you sue that client, they will go nuts, and they will make up any excuse not uh, to pay you because, you know, Again, good clients will work. The bad clients will say anything. And you have a fiduciary duty to those clients to be honest, and they're now going to say all this terrible stuff about you. All right. Should I sue? Should I sue? Never sue a client without asking yourself these questions. First of all, think about how that bill would look. Uh, drafting original petition, 8.2 hours. Yeah, that's probably not going to survive scrutiny. Um, overcharging for things, you know, legal research, 3.4 hours on, uh, I don't know, tortious interference. No, that should not take any lawyer 3.4 hours to research tortious interference. Um, well, you have, your billing rate is too high for your community. You know, in, in Austin, it's typical the you expect lawyers to bill anywhere from, you know, two hundred to five hundred dollars an hour. But if you're billing, if you've been out of law school three years and you're billing five hundred dollars an hour, eh, it's not going to be survive scrutiny. And then again, what's the timing of the controversy? How how far are you through the case? Is a judge going to let you out anyway, or is he going to say no? You your trial is on Monday. I'm not letting you out, Mr. DeClue, because I don't care if your clients run out of money. You're going to finish handling this darn case. And most important. Before you sue, ask yourself the big basic question, will I ever get any money or will I have another nice drawer full of, of uh, default judgments or judgments against a client who will never pay me? If your goal, again, is to be paid, don't sue for the principle of proving that you were right and owed the fees. It's all about being paid, not proving who has the best ego in the courthouse. Is it likely this client will ever pay you? Ever? Don't sue. Um, short answer, you probably shouldn't sue. Don't sue unless now. There are, I've had this argument with lawyers, and they're right. If it's an existential threat to your firm, this was the biggest piece of business you have. They owe you $35,000 on a two-lawyer firm, and you're going to go out of business if you don't get paid. Yeah, I think then you should do that very carefully, but have somebody handle it for you. In other words, I really need that money. Remember that the counterclaim against you for all those horrible things you did wrong is going to be a compulsory counterclaim in almost every civil jurisdiction in the United States of America because it arises out of the same transaction that you're suing for. I represented them in this case, and their counterclaim is yes, and he screwed up that case, and that's why I don't have him. Um, and preferred option is I've had extremely good luck representing people before uh, fee dispute committees. You know, our local bar association has a wonderful, honest fair. They have non-lawyers and lawyers on it, and they really try to do the right thing when they hear both sides of the story. And my experience generally is the lawyer wins in those fee dispute committees, and it always makes you look good when you write the client, hey, I'm happy to go to the fee dispute committee of my hometown, which is, has both lawyers and non-lawyers on it, and have them look at this. And if the client rejects that, you also look good for the judge if you have to sue them. But remember, that's the least preferred option. Everybody's going to have difficult clients. Why? I told you why. Because you see people at their worst. You don't see people when they're happy. You have to always remember to be the adult in the room. Think of every single email you send of that client being on a poster board in front of it. And, you know, I've written horrible emails, and then I take a breath, and I revise them so they're nice, no matter how horrible it is, the one is that I'm responding to. And that's going to serve me well. Never write a letter you'd hate to see on a poster. 
Never threaten. Don't say things like a passive threat is, uh, well, you do that and you see what's going to happen to you. Well, you haven't expressly said, but it sounds like a threat. So don't do that. And take a breath when you want to respond. Uh, the 10 biggest mistakes we have, not establishing reasonable expectations at the beginning of the relationship, right? Not uh, not resisting the client's invitation to guess or predict outcomes. Say, oh yeah, I'll win this case 20 times out of 20 times. Don't do that. Said, from what you've told me, I believe you have a very meritorious case. I don't know all the facts. I want to reserve judgment until I see actually what the facts and what their response is going to be uh, in case it's something you were not aware of, which obviously I, they are aware of, but they're not telling you. And then again, not keeping the client form regularly, truthfully, aggressively to avoid mistakes and negative inferences. All right. Number four, failing to respond to a client contact that changes the narrative. That's when he says, you said this was $1,500 and you, and you don't respond and say yes, and you said this was all agreed to and it wasn't. Stupid billing. Don't using, you, you don't use uh, correct intelligent descriptions. Writing a letter or an email, number six, that you'd hate to see on a poster in front of a grievance committee. Seven, telling a lie or treating anyone involved in this matter with contempt or disrespect. Not only does that put you on the outs with your colleagues, because you think, oh yeah, I've got such swagger and I'm kicking your ass in this case. Don't ever do that. Don't, you will learn over time that this could be you next with getting your little hiney kicked. So always be gracious in both defeat and in uh, victory. And if you tell a lie, remember, you can have a wonderful career for 15 uh, years. And if you misrepresent a fact, that the judge knows, that's what they talk about in judges' meetings. They don't talk about the normal things. Yeah, I ordered child support today. No, they talk. Claude Flew came in and told me a lie during a hearing. I will never trust that guy again. That's what judges talk about in their meetings. Um, or leading an opposing party to believe that you're neutral. That's like when you have somebody on the other side that's uh, not represented by a lawyer. And you said, oh, don't worry. I'm a neutral. I'll get this worked out for you. You can't let them believe you're neutral. And then sending a communication that would burn a bridge. Okay. How, once you find a conflict, how do you disclose it? Mere disclosure is not sufficient. You have to really, uh, re reasonably believe that your interests won't be affected by representation. And here are the applicable standards of disclosure. The existence of the conflict, the nature of the conflict, the implications of the conflict, and I actually have conflict waiver letters, form letters that you can kind of cut and paste the um, these things into if you want any of my form letters, I'm glad to send it to you. The possible adverse con consequences of common representation and the advantages. So the existence, the nature of it is that you, uh, he and I have own a condo together down in Palm Springs, but I still think I can represent you fairly even though we're friends, blah, blah, blah. Um, so you handling a grievance, always respond timely and completely to whatever your grievance system is, whether it's the grievance committee or the Office of Disciplinary Counsel, whoever is sending that to the Supreme Court Committee on Attorney Discipline. Always respond timely and completely. And don't respond pro se. The way you should respond is to have a lawyer at least edit your letter and send it out under his or her name, even if you want to attach an affidavit by you. Because no matter how, it's a very upsetting thing to get a grievance, and no matter how thorough and objective you can be, little bad words will creep into your response, like maniac and other bad words. <laughs> All right, know your deadlines. Here are my three rules. Treat every client like you're going to live next door to them the rest of your life. It really, it really changes the way you think about things, right? Um, I want every client who sits in my office or I represent, I think about if they live next door to me, would Mr. Jones be happy with the way I handle his case? Treat them like that and it changes the way you think about the client. Um, always tell the truth. I said, truly, there's far less paperwork. You know, if something happens in the case, Notify them promptly. If it's something bad, they did this, they did that. It's your best defense. I've notified you within uh, one, I'm, one hour of this happening. So always do that. Always tell the truth. And then you simply, unless I said, again, unless it is an existential threat, you don't sue your client. 